This video is about arc length and rotational velocity. We're going to cover quite a few word problems. First, let's establish the relationship between arc length and angles and the radius of a circle. What we have here is an illustration of some rotation that has occurred. This segment that goes from the origin outward into quadrant one is the terminal side where we imagine that this segment begins going completely horizontally on the x-axis and has undergone some rotation along the circle. So here's our radius r. It goes only to the edge of the circle. This line goes a little bit past. It has gone through some rotation. We'll use Greek letter theta to represent the angle or radian measure of this rotation. And there is a corresponding arc length s, which is this piece in between our initial point at zero degrees and our ending point after this line has gone through a rotation theta. If you have recently been working with the unit circle, then you would have seen problems where the angle and this piece of the circle were the same. But that relationship is only true on a unit circle when the radius equals 1. For circles of varying sizes, this relationship is described by arc length is radius times the angle measure. So this is the first important formula to memorize, s equals r theta. It is the basic relationship between radius of the circle, the angle of rotation, and the corresponding arc length. One detail that's very important to point out is that theta in this formula is in radians. It is by default in units of radians. So we would not want to find theta using this equation and have an answer in degrees. If we wanted an answer in degrees, we would actually have to convert our answer from radians into degrees. And we'll see some examples of that shortly. Now let's talk about the quantities involved when points rotate along the edge of a circle. Here are two points rotating along circles. The inner purple circle has a radius of 2.5, and, and this outer circle, radius 5. Let's first talk about which of these points is moving faster? And you could think of this in two different ways. For one, they're each taking the same amount of time to go all the way around the circle. They're both moving at about 11 rotations per minute. About five and a half seconds for each of these circles to make one full rotation, but it's one rotation in equal amounts of time. So in that sense, they're moving at the same speed. But now think about speed in terms of distance covered per time. We know this circle with radius 5 has a greater circumference. Its circumference is twice as long as the circumference of this inner circle with radius 2.5. So the outer circle is actually covering more ground in the same amount of time. So in that regard, it is moving faster. So we're making a distinction between two different types of speed. A rotational speed, which is how far around the circle is it going per time, or what angle is it traveling per time, and linear speed, which is more like the speed that we're used to dealing with, like distance equals rate times time, rate is distance divided by time, that kind of speed where we're thinking about the actual distance along the edge of the circle that the point is traveling. And that's where we're going to work in the other values, s for arc length, and we'll keep using theta for angle, and the radius r is going to play a role as well. Here's where the points end up after moving for one second. These points have different radii, definitely. One has radius 2.5, the other radius 5, and we're talking about the circles along which they're moving. But they have the same angle. They've moved for the same number of radians or degrees. But we can definitely see that their arc lengths are different. The relationship that we want to use when we refer to the fact that they've moved the same angle per time, that's our angular velocity, or rotational velocity, or rotational speed. Basically, any combination of rotational or angular and velocity or speed. And that is describing the angle that we've traveled per time. So it is a speed in terms of a kind of distance per time, but it's not distance in terms of the arc length, the path that it's traveling, it is in terms of just the angle of rotation it has made. 
So angular velocity will tell us that these two have the same value for angular velocity. They're moving the same angle per time. This becomes our second important formula to memorize. Omega equals theta over t. It looks like a lowercase w, but it's a lowercase omega, Greek letter omega, and it's measuring the angle that's traveled per time. Let's get into a little bit more of the details to break down our linear speed, the fact that these two points are traveling different arc lengths per time. Bringing in our old relationships, s equals r theta. For the inner circle, it has a smaller arc length and a smaller radius. Our outer circle has a greater arc length and a greater radius, but the angle is the same. When we saw those two points moving around a circle, they were traveling the same angle per time. They had the same angular velocity, omega. But thinking about how much ground they were covering on their respective rims of the circle, on their arc lengths, these two points had traveled this far in one second, but we could see that on the inner circle it was a much smaller arc length. It was actually half the arc length because the circle has half the radius. And our outer point was covering a greater arc length in one second, so it must have, therefore, a greater speed. And at this point we're talking about linear speed. How much of the circle is it traveling per time? I could work in what I know about distance, rate, and time. That rate is speed. Rate equals distance traveled per time. And in this example, the distance traveled is the arc length s, and t is our time. I could represent one angular speed for this point on the inner circle. It is s1 per time. s1 is that distance on the arc length it's traveled. And a different velocity, or a different linear speed, for the point on the outer circle, which has a greater arc length to travel. Now we're beginning to set up a third important relationship, but we won't be explicit about it just yet. Let's continue to see how these relationships, these different equations, work with each other. We established at first the s equals r theta relationship, and we know that these two arc lengths are different because the radii of the circles are different. One radius is twice the other one, so the arc length for that radius is twice as large as the arc length for this first radius. We're representing that with these two equations. Now we're keeping theta the same because we can see that as these two points have moved, they've moved through the same angle, but with different radii, they have different arc lengths, and with different arc lengths, they have to have different linear speeds, but same angle, so they have the same rotational velocity. Our next move is a little bit of algebra where we'll do some substitution. I want you to look at the equation in green that we have here and the equation in green that we have here. This one is representing linear speed as arc length per time, and over here we're saying our arc length is radius times the angle. So we'll take this expression and substitute it in place of S1 over here, and we'll do the same thing with these equations in maroon. So now we have V1 equals, in place of the S1, we use R1 theta. And in our other equation, in place of S2, we're using R2 theta. And it gets us to these two equations. Still valid, now we're showing that our linear speed can be thought of as radius times angle, and that's basically because that gives us our arc length, and our, ang and our linear speed is arc length per time. What we want to see next is that each of these fractions has a quantity theta over t. And we know theta over t is the definition of rotational velocity. So we'll pull off the theta over t in each of these and replace it with omega to show that our linear speed can also be represented as radius times the angular speed. And that gives us our final formula. So now we have a total of four. V there it is explicitly, equals s over t, our linear speed or linear velocity is arc length per time. Our linear speed is also represented by radius times angular velocity. And along with s equals r theta and omega equals theta over t, these four formulas make up the building blocks for solving the word problems that we are going to see very soon. But a quick breakdown of each of these four. First, the s equals r theta, that was the very first one we looked at. 
it's really just based on some geometry that given a circle we can find an arc length corresponding to some rotation in the circle and the relationship is that the arc length equals that angle times the radius and we talked about that theta the angle must be in radians next we established our rotational velocity just as a measure of through what angle are we traveling per time it's a it's an amount of rotation per time so that's still a pretty basic buildup of speed how we talk about speed or velocity some distance traveled per time and that's kind of the connection between these two or the parallel between these two rotational velocity is the angle per time but linear speed is our arc length per time now we'll start to look at some examples but basic strategy, and this is a strategy that you would use in past examples when you're using formulas. If I'm trying to solve for a specific variable, I know which formula I can use if it contains that variable and all the other values are known. For example, if I had a problem that asked me to find V, I see I could use either of these two formulas because they both contain V and this one would be a great one to use if the problem gave me a value for s and for t and this formula would be a good one to use if the problem gave me a value for r and for omega so our approach will be to identify what information is given and then see which of these formulas we could use based on it has the variable that we want to find and we have enough information to substitute into each of the other variables in that formula first example for a circle that has a radius of 45 centimeters what angle corresponds to an arc length of 12 centimeters can we come up with a quick picture for what this problem is asking we've got a circle our basic relationship between the angle of rotation the radius of the circle and the arc length and information given to us was that our arc length was 12 centimeters and that the radius of the circle is 45 centimeters we would like to come up with the angle theta so we have s we have r we're looking for theta so we could use the formula s equals r theta it's a good choice because s and r are known theta is unknown that's the angle that we're looking for let's solve this equation for theta basically dividing both sides by r and i have quantities i can plug in place of s and r it is important just like it is important for us to always remember that theta must be in radians our measures of distance have to all have the same units so they don't specifically have to be feet or meters but they have to agree so since s is in centimeters radius must also be in centimeters we're in good shape there I can do this divide it's gonna give me a repeating decimal so I'll keep it as a simplified fraction for now but what units will we have now our units of centimeter have canceled we know that this is theta which will give us automatically answers that have units in radians so definitely I can call it 4 15 radians the radians is a dimensionless unit so when we see these two units of distance cancel each other out radians kicks in as really just a ratio of distances what I would want you to think about going forward is when we solve for theta it will always be in radians and what we'll see with our units is actually our units in the fraction cancel one another and we're left with no visible units we can put back radians we may be interested in a decimal approximation it was about 0.27 radians now what if we want an answer in degrees what angle in degree measure 4 15 radians let's do a unit conversion I like to when I'm converting units always multiply by fractions and I think a lot about the units that I start with we're starting with radians radians this unit is like it's in the numerator so I want to cancel it out by having radians in the denominator and degrees in the numerator each of these fractions it's going to be a unit fraction where I basically show the equivalence between two units so I could put in here something about how many radians equals how many degrees like 360 degrees equals 2 pi radians or 180 degrees is 1 pi radians I like that one but I'm guided by starting off with radians knowing that I want to get rid of that unit of radians and have degrees left over so my degree unit is up in the numerator in this unit fraction the radian units will cancel 
I'll have degrees for my units of the answer. I'm trying to stay exact, so I'm keeping this in terms of pi. I just noticed that 4 fifteenths times 180 equaled 48. So as an exact degree measure, 48 over pi, and as a decimal approximation, about 15.28 degrees. Now we're building up a flow through these problems where we examine what information is given and determine which of those formulas we should use, but there will be multiple paths through these problems, and at times you might even see a way to find the answer that doesn't use those formulas. For example, this problem, our circle had radius 45 centimeters, so what's the circumference of a circle, the 2 pi r formula? So if the radius is 45, then our distance around the circle, the circumference or the perimeter of that circle, would be 90 pi centimeters. Now we're talking about an arc length of 12 centimeters. So I could say, well, what fraction of the entire circle is that? 12 out of 90 pi. So our arc length s is this fraction of the total circumference. Now we're trying to come up with what angle measure does that correspond to? If I have just established that our arc length is this fraction of the total circumference, then the degree measure is also this fraction of our total degrees in a circle, 360 degrees. Okay? So what I did was I said, I know the radius and I know the arc length is 12. I could figure out what the total circumference is. So the arc length we're interested in is this fraction of the total circumference. Therefore, the angle is that fraction of our total angle measure in a circle, 360 degrees. So I do this multiplication, 12, nine, 12 over 90 pi times 360 degrees equals the 48 over pi, or approximately 15.28 degrees. So I didn't specifically use the s equals r theta formula. I used some ideas, kind of like a proportion actually, about well, the arc length is what fraction of the entire circumference. It corresponds to some angle that is a fraction of the total 360 degrees. Going forward, we will really stick to identifying which of those formulas we could use, but understand it's not required, and that often in these problems, we can see some other pathway through these problems that will get us a correct answer. Moving on to our next example. What is the arc length that subtends a 54 degree angle in a circle with a 5 inch diameter. First a quick diagram. It's another problem that is pertaining to the relationship between s, r, and theta. We're asked to find the arc length s. We have an angle measure, but it is in degrees, so we'll need to make sure that we convert that into radians. Theta must be in radians in these formulas. And radius we don't have, but we do have diameter. Well, as soon as we see a given diameter, I'd like to right away change that into a radius. So we're cutting it in half, radius 2.5 inches. So one change taken care of that diameter is not useful, cut it in half to use the radius. Next, the 54 degrees is our angle measure. We need to change that into radians. So I'm multiplying by a conversion factor, starting with 54 degrees, this time I need to cancel out the degrees and leave radians behind. So I'll need degrees in the denominator and radians up in the numerator. In terms of irrational numbers, decimals that go forever with, don't, with no repeating pattern, I like to save all my rounding till the very end. So in these problems where there's a multiplication with pi, I'm trying to keep it in terms of pi. It means, for me, 54 over 180. What will that equal? I'm just thinking simplified fraction, so I can keep the pi in there. So the 54 over 180 simplifies to 3 tenths. Our angle measure is 3 pi over 10, and now we're in radians. And now we can go ahead and use one of our formulas. S equals r. Theta is a good one. It's solved for s we can plug in r and theta now that theta is in radians. We're multiplying 2.5 inches by 3 pi over 10 radians. Another example of how the dimensionless radian units work here, if we're multiplying radians by any other unit, that other unit takes over, the radians goes away. So multiplying inches by radians leaves us with inches. Still trying to keep it in terms of pi, the 3 over 10 times 2 and a half is 3 fourths, so an exact answer, our arc length is 3 pi over 4 inches, and as a decimal approximation, about 2.36 inches. 
Oh, lastly, we didn't mention the word subtends. Basically means opposite. So what is the arc length that is opposite of this angle 54 degrees? So just to clear up that word right there. Next example, a bicycle wheel has a 16-inch radius. How far does the bicycle roll when the wheel turns 80 degrees? So not so sure right now if we're still dealing with an S equals R theta type problem if we're just talking about relationship between arc length, radius, and angle measure. It's possibly shaping up that way. Well, let's figure out what each of these quantities stands for. The 16-inch radius is pretty self-explanatory, but what are we after to answer this question? How far does the bicycle roll? Let's think about this diagram right here. It's a circle, it's, let's, it's a wheel now, and this point here is right where the wheel is making contact with the ground, and I have a radius drawn in on the wheel. If I think about moving this wheel, having this wheel start to turn, it's going to roll forward, and as it rolls forward, this point is going to be back to the left of where it initially started as the wheel rolls forward. This point moves clockwise. And now let's draw where the point is where the wheel is touching the ground right now. Now it's moved forward this distance, but the actual distance that it has rolled forward is exactly the same as this arc length right here. So as this circle rolls, the point that is touching the ground goes from right here on the wheel, and it moves along the edge of the circle, just like an arc length, just like any other point traveling along a circle. So it is arc length that we have in this problem, what we're asked to find in terms of how far does the wheel roll? Well, that is going to be arc length. So moving on, we've got our radius equals 16 inches. We have an angle measure in degrees, 80 degrees. We've got to do a unit conversion to get this into radians. I'm multiplying by this factor, pi radians equals 180 degrees. It's canceling out the degrees, leaving behind radians, and we'll put radians there when there are no other units left. And the 80 over 180 equals 4 ninths. So an exact answer in terms of pi, 4 pi over 9 radians. Now we can go to the formula S equals R theta. We're multiplying 16 inches by 4 pi over 9 radians. We know the radians units will give way to the inches units. We'll have our answer as the arc length in inches. And this product here, we won't get anything to simplify our denominator as an exact answer, 64 pi over 9 inches. As a decimal approximation, about 22.3 inches. And in general, how should we round? I would go with what is asked for in the question. Round the nearest tenth, round the nearest hundredth, etc. In my personal philosophy, exact answer is always the nicest thing for me to see. So 64 pi over 9, I'd say, is a perfectly fine and completely accurate answer. I don't, I'm not compelled to come up with a decimal approximation. And if I do, I should see if the problem directs me to round in a specific way. And now another example. I apologize, I left out an article here. Through what angle should a 1 meter diameter wheel turn to roll 50 feet? Round the nearest hundredth of a degree. We showed with the last problem that a wheel that is rolling, the distance that, th that the wheel moves is actually exactly equal to the arc length of that circle. So it is a problem about arc length and radius, and we are looking for angle. Quickly, we've got a 1 meter diameter, so let's right away deal with that and get it to a 0.5 meter radius. Theta is what we're trying to find. S, our arc length, is the distance that the wheel has rolled 50 feet. Now, our problem here is that our units of distance do not agree. We have the radius is in meters, the arc length is in feet. So we need to either convert meters to feet or convert feet to meters. My choice is usually to go from a larger unit to a smaller unit. So I'll go from meters, which is a bigger distance, convert that down to feet, which is a shorter, a smaller distance. I'm multiplying by a conversion factor that has meters in the denominator and feet up in the numerator. And I looked one up, and this is even still an approximation, 3.28084 feet per meter. I think it's actually 2808399 maybe. So I'm careful here. I'm beginning to round a little bit early in the problem. That's usually unavoidable if we're going between units that are metric versus 
English or Imperial or whatever you would call it, the, the feet, pounds, ounces, etc. units, not metric stuff. So we're starting to round a little bit. I, I'm just keeping several decimal places until the very end of the problem. Don't want to cut things off too soon. So about 1.64042 feet is our radius. Next, we had an equation s equals r theta. We're trying to find theta, so I'll go ahead and solve for theta. Divide r on both sides. s over r will equal theta. We've got quantities we can use. s is 50. r is 1.64042. They're both in feet, so that's good. We know those units of feet are canceling each other, but we'll end up with units that are radians. So about 30.480 radians. Getting close, but we need this in degrees, so I need to convert radians into degrees. This answer coming out of the formula is always automatically in radians. Since the question wants degrees, we've got to take it further. I want to cancel radians, so I've got radians in the denominator. Got degrees up in the numerator, so those will be the units of our answer. So I'll do the multiply 30.480 times 180 divided by pi. I'm right at the end, so I'll go ahead and round it to the nearest hundredth, and I get 1,746.38 degrees. Now, we're not thrown off by a number that's this large because we know now that we're dealing with angles and circles, we can handle angles of any measure. And an angle measure this big just means that we've gone through several rotations. Each 360 degrees is one full rotation. So in this case, we've made several rotations. We've made about 4.85 rotations. Not asked for in this problem, but sometimes just interesting to see exactly what this degree measure represents. So a wheel that is a one meter diameter, if it's rolling 50 feet, that wheel is going to have to make almost five full rotations. And continuing with another example, a wheel with a two-foot radius is spinning at three radians per second. What is the linear speed of a point on the edge of the wheel? Now, we're definitely talking about different relationships. We're working in time as a factor, things actually moving. So the s equals r theta probably won't be our key formula here. Well, what info do we get? We've got the radius equals two feet. 3 radians per second is what kind of measure? That is an angle per time. That's our angular speed. Omega equals 3 radians per second. And I would say linear speed if it gave me some distance per time, miles per hour, feet per second. But if I see an angle per time, it's got to be the rotational velocity or the angular velocity, the omega. We've got r, we've got omega. We're after linear speed v. Do we have a formula that uses r and omega and v? If so, we can use that to find v. And great, we have one. v equals r omega. We're multiplying 2 feet by 3 radians per second. A case where the radians units are taken over by the feet, so it's 6 feet per second once we multiply the 2 times the 3. Don't forget that part. We're beginning to see that the key th path through these problems is carefully identifying what info is given and then which formula we should use, and all along we're cautious about our units. The next example, a different wheel spins at 36 RPM, that's revolutions per minute. Through what distance does a point 5 feet from the center of the wheel move in 20 seconds? Okay. Based on the amount of information given, it's starting to look a little bit hazy in terms of what this situation is actually describing. What I like to do is let's just sort through this info given, determine what each quantity represents. First of all, the 36 RPM, rotations per minute. That's got to be angular velocity. It's some amount of angle. It's not a feet per minute or miles per minute or some distance. It's a rotation. It's about how far along in a circle are we going. That's got to be omega. R, we have radius. That's the distance from center. So this point 5 feet from the center of the wheel is a reference to our radius being 5 feet. We're interested in what's going on within 20 seconds, so we're also given time. What is it that we're looking for? Through what distance does this point travel? And, and when it comes to distance in the context of these problems, that is arc length, s. So we need to find s, and we're given omega, r, and t. 
Well, let's go through our formulas and identify any that use s. We've got s equals r theta. But this one's a no-go because we've got a value for r, but we don't have a value for theta. So we've hit a problem there. v equals s over t, our expression of linear speed. We could solve this for s. We'd get s equals v times t. We've got a value for t we could use, but we don't have v. So this formula, again, is a dead end. In this case, we have to work in at least two of these formulas. Remember that a formula is good to use if we can fill in all of the quantities except for one. Our problem here is that we've had two unknown quantities, so these formulas are not good as is. Let's look at what our other formulas were available. We've got omega equals theta over t. I could use this because we know omega, we know t. I don't really need to find theta to answer this question, but once I do find theta, I could plug it in here, and then I have a theta to go with my r, where I could then find s. So we're keeping the same flow where we carefully figure out what information is given, and then which formula to use. And as soon as we encounter this, this situation, where we don't have enough information to use one equation, we'll have to use two. Basically, our path goes through any formula we see where we can fill in all of the unknown quantities except for one. So this is a formula we could use. And the way we would end up using it would be solve this one for theta. We know omega, we know t given to us in the problem. And since omega times t equals theta, we could substitute omega t in place of this theta. And we're getting s equals r times omega times t. You could say it's a fifth valid formula that we could use, but it's really just a result of combining two of our other formulas. Do we have a different option? We, we do have yet another option. Thinking about v equals s over t, we couldn't use this because both v and s were unknown. But our fourth formula was that v equals r omega, and this one we could use because we knew r, we know omega. So once we find r and omega, we could substitute that in place of v. Well, let's take this equation, v equals s over t. Let's solve for s equals vt. Now let's do that substitution, r omega in place of v. And again, we'll get to that same result, s equals r times omega times t. So whichever path we choose, they will get us to that final formula that's needed for this problem but it was definitely necessary that we put two of our formulas together. So that's our first main point with this example. We can hit a roadblock, but this will be the path. Call on some of those other formulas that maybe don't have that quantity that we're looking for to answer the question, like in this one we're after arc length, but our first move was to go to a formula that did not have arc length, but we needed it to come up with theta so that we could use this formula or this route, both ways getting s equals r omega t. So that's what we'll use to come up with our final answer for arc length. But there are some other sticking points here that we have to be cautious with. First of all, omega, our rotational velocity, right now it's in 36 revolutions or rotations I have here per minute, RPM. I think to be technical, the wheel itself would be rotating, but a point on the wheel would be revolving. So it could, it's a little ambiguous there. But anyways, what's not ambiguous is, just like theta had to be in radians, omega also has to be in radians per time. Now the time part, it doesn't matter, minutes, seconds, hours, but the angle part in the numerator must be in radians. It's as important as that theta must always be in radians. So omega needs to be radians per time whenever we use it in a formula. We've got some converting to do. Let's first check out the other given quantities. r equals 5 feet, that's our point, 5 feet from the center, time 20 seconds. So now let's begin to do some converting. We need to convert our rotations into radians, and we also need our units of time to agree. So main rules about units are omega and theta must always use radians is the first most important rule. And the second most important rule is that the other units, whether they are in time or distance, must use the same. 
So where we see that r is 5 feet, anything else that's a measure of distance is going to be feet. And here our time is 20 seconds, so any place else that we see time also has to be seconds. So the 36 rotations per minute is going to undergo a few different changes. First going to deal with the rotations into radians. I want to cancel out rotations, so I've got rotations in the denominator in the conversion factor. What unit can I come up with here? Well, I do know radians. How many radians are in a full circle? 2 pi radians. So there's a good conversion factor, canceling out rotations. Now we would have 72 pi radians per minute, but let's go ahead and change the minutes into seconds as well. Minute is in the denominator, so my conversion factor will use minute in the numerator. And I know one minute equals 60 seconds. Cancel those minutes. Look at what units are left over. We have radians left over in the numerator and seconds in the denominator. So we're in good shape. We've got our angular velocity in radians per second. I want to multiply across the top, divide from the denominators, but I'm keeping it in terms of pi. So I've got a 36 times 2 is 72 over 60. That's 6 fifths when it's simplified, so 6 pi over 5 radians per second. So all of our measurements of time are in seconds. Feet, is, we only have this one place where we're measuring distance. Our omega has radians, so we're ready to use the formula. R times omega times t, 5 feet times 6 pi over 5 radians per second, times 20 seconds. We can see our units of seconds will cancel. The radian units will go and, and leave behind just the feet. So this multiplication comes out pretty nice. 5 cancel with the 5. 6 pi times 20 equals 120 pi feet. Seconds cancel. Radians are gone. Feet, the unit left behind. As an approximate decimal value, 120 times pi, approximately 377 feet. Here's another example. A truck wheel has a 32-inch diameter. Find the angle through which the wheel turns in 45 seconds if the truck is moving at 15 miles per hour. If the last example felt sort of smooth towards the end, you saw the path through, this would be a good example for you to pause the video and try on your own, and then come back and we'll go through it together. Or you could just keep watching as we go through it together right now. We're picking out what given information there is. The wheel has a 32-inch diameter. Let's get rid of the diameter and go for radius, cut it in half, 16 inches. Next, find the angle. So we're interested in finding theta. We've got a measure of time, 45 seconds. The truck is moving at 15 miles per hour. So here is linear speed. We talked about v being a measure of arc length per time, but remember that example, the first example about a wheel that was rolling forward. We said that a rolling wheel really told us about the arc length. So a truck moving at 15 miles per hour is some arc length per time. So definitely v equals 15 miles per hour. We're going to have several main issues in this one, very similar to the last example. We've got some problems with our units do not agree, and we don't have just one formula to use. We're going to need to use two. If I start out finding the formulas that use theta, because I see I, I've got to find theta to answer this question, well, my first one, theta equals s over r, got r but don't have s, so hit a, hit a roadblock. The other one, theta equals omega t. We've got t, but not omega, so same problem. Let's go and look at what our other formulas were. We had s equals v times t. We've got v, we've got t, so we could come up with s. And once we had s, I could put that up here and do s over r and get theta. So vt in place of s gives me this new formula, theta equals vt over r. And this looks great because it uses r and t and v, all the quantities I know, and it's going to give me theta. So that's great. And just for a little bit of closure, what happens if we looked at our fourth formula, omega equals v over r? The substitute here, we're putting v over r in place of omega there, and we get theta equals v over r times t. Same formula we get right here. So that's what we'll use. I'm already getting started with my unit conversion now. I've got miles per hour, 
and here inches and seconds. So the units of distance have to match. Miles and inches are no good. I'm going to go from the big unit miles down to the small unit inches. And I'm also going to change my hour down to seconds. So I'm doing a lot of changes with my linear speed. First, let's cancel the miles and get feet in its place. I don't have it memorized the number of inches per mile, but this one I know, 5,280 feet per mile. Cancel out those miles. Now, I've got feet. I've got to cancel out feet and leave inches, and I can do that with the 12 inches equals 1 foot. Feet units are gone. So a quick survey of what units are left. I'm still looking at inches per hour, and I need to get my hour down to seconds. The hour is in the denominator, so I need to cancel it with hour up in the numerator, and I know 1 hour equals 3,600 seconds, so the hour units are gone, and we're left with inches per second. I need to take this 15, multiply it to each number in the numerators, and divide by each number in the denominators. Actually turned out to be a nice integer, 264 inches per second. So our distances are all in inches, our time all in seconds. We're ready to go to the formula, VT over R, 264 inches per second times 45 seconds divided by 16 inches. Now our units, the seconds will cancel and the inches will cancel. Our units have totally canceled and we know that that means that we have units of radians left over, just in case we didn't remember that theta would always give us units of radians. So this multiply and divide leaves us with 742.5 radians.